All right. Welcome to CSI Skill Tree, everyone. Uh, in this series, we take a close look at video games to examine and celebrate the work they do in envisioning the future and building rich and thought-provoking worlds. My name is Joey Eshrick. Uh, I work at the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, and I'll be your host today. And uh, we're going to talk about the classic science fiction strategy game, Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri, which was developed by Fire Axis Games and published by Electronic Arts in 1999. It was designed by a team co-led by the game's namesake, Sid Meier, the, who's the legendary developer of the Civilization series of games, uh, as well as Brian Reynolds, who's a longtime collaborator of Meyer's and was also the lead designer for a number uh, of other games, including the popular strategy series, Rise of Nations. Um, and I have with me today, and I'll talk more about them in a moment, um, Bodhisattva, Chato Pajay, and uh, Arkady Martin. So thank you both so much for being here and uh, cracking open this game with me. Alpha Centauri grows out of the incredibly influential Civilization series, as I said, but projects it forward into the 22nd century when seven competing factions from Earth land on a planet called Chiron, but in the game usually just called Planet. Uh, they vie for control and dominance, negotiating and cooperating and making war, not just with one another, but also with planets, indigenous life forms. So to introduce the game, uh, we're going to run the short opening video that plays when you first launch it. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. He drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. The Conclave Bible, Data Links. Earth 2060. A small group of colonists leaves the ravages of Earth for a distant planet orbiting Alpha Centauri's primary star. Their ship, the United Nations starship Unity, carries them on their journey to a new world and a new hope for humankind. Along the way, a reactor malfunction damages the Unity, precipitating a crisis among the ship's seven most powerful leaders. As they enter the Alpha Centauri system, the crew splits into seven distinct factions, divided not by nationality, but by ideology and their vision for the new world. After the ship breaks apart, the seven leaders guide their chosen crew down to the surface of planet, seeking their destiny beneath an alien sky. So uh, Alpha Centauri is considered canonical by many game critics and historians, and it won a number of awards in the year of its release. And uh, an equally acclaimed expansion pack called Alien Crossfire was published later in 1999. But um, we'll have our hands full today with the main game I've found. So we, we won't talk too much about the expansion, although I can't promise that Bodhi won't bring it up a few times. Uh, there's so much to unpack with this game as I've learned more about it from fascinating science fiction world building to climate and energy issues, colonialism, fungus, of course, diplomacy, and more. And uh, luckily, we have our, our two amazing guests here to help shed light on, on what makes this game work and why it's so memorable. So uh, my, uh, so I'm going to introduce our two guests really quick. And, and, and as I said, I'm delighted to be joined by Bodhisattva Chattopajay. Uh, hi, Bodhi. 
Uh, Bodhi is an associate professor in global culture studies at the University of Oslo and principal investigator of the European Research Council, the European Research Council project, Co-Futures, Pathways to Possible Presence, as well as the Norwegian Research Council project, Science Fictionality. And he also runs the Holodeck, a games research lab at the University of Oslo. And Bodhi knows an incredible amount about Alpha Centauri and he sold me on uh, having this event uh, focus on it. I'm very glad he did. And so it's thanks to his knowledge and enthusiasm that we're all here today. Uh, I'm also honored to be joined by Arkady Martin. And hi, Arkady, again. Uh, Arkady is a speculative fiction author and her novel, A Memory Called Empire, which you should read, uh, won the Hugo Award for Best Novel in 2020. Uh, a sequel uh, titled A Desolation Called Peace is coming in March, 2021. She's also a historian of the Byzantine Empire, a city planner, and currently a policy advisor for the New Mexico Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources Department, where she works on climate change mitigation, energy grid modernization, and resiliency planning. So we'll start uh, by talking a bit more about the game's narrative and structure and mechanics, uh, its close relationship to the Civilization series, which some of you may be familiar with. Uh, while we're doing that, we're going to run a gameplay video in the background just so you can get a sense of the game's uh, look and feel. Um, so, so I'll warn you if you haven't played many 90s computer strategy games or if you've just been away since the 90s, uh, it's a deluge of information. It's a lot of menus. It's very visually dense. Um, so just try to let it wash over you, I think. And uh, Bodhi and Arkady will help contextualize what you're seeing a bit. And uh, I must say another warning, uh, I'm playing in this video and I'm not good at this game. Uh, I find it a little overwhelming at times. Um, and I feel like I'm perpetually on the learning curve. So, so, so bear with me, but it will give you a sense of like how things look and you can see what happens when you don't play very efficiently. Um, so uh, after that opening segment, we're gonna delve, I think more into the games, uh, uh, you know, themes and big ideas. And then we'll turn to responding to questions and comments from you all. Uh, so throughout the conversation, anytime, uh, not just at the end, please use the Q and A button that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom window. And you could submit a question or comment there. And so you don't have to like wait to submit something until, until we're actually taking and answering questions. We'll, we'll keep them there and we'll, we'll, we'll turn to them when we're ready. So uh, as soon as something occurs to you, just drop it in there. Um, thank you so much for being with us here this morning or, 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 or evening and sharing your time with us. And, and so without any further ado, let's get underway. Uh, so buddy, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Um, just could, could you start by telling us a little bit more about Alpha Centauri, how it, how it like its genre, uh, sort of how it fits in some of the basics just beyond what we saw uh, in the video and what we're seeing uh, in the gameplay? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for uh, this invitation and this chance to talk to you and Arcadia about this game, which is, I mean, this is one of my favorite games of all time. It's, it's kind of like, uh, and I'm, I'm sure for, it will be the same for many uh, of those who will watch this video later or uh, tuning in right now. I mean, it's it's a game that's released 20 over 20 years ago, right? And we keep returning to this game and this game still has that kind of cult following. And um, and like you uh, just said, Jerry, like, you know, you keep discovering new things. And I have played this game for so many years and I still keep discovering things. So um, it's an endlessly rewarding, rich game. And in many ways, I think, um, the fact that I that I played this game as a as a teenager, and of course I've always been interested in science fiction. But the fact that I uh, kind of went on to do so much of science fiction research and thinking in terms of history of technology and so on has to do with the kinds of games I played. And Alpha Centauri, I think, is kind of one of those formative games for me. Uh, and there's so much going on in this game. It's it's just uh, it's it's quite remarkable, really, how rich this is. Uh, and and I mean this is uh, it's it's considered to be very much connected to the civilization canon, right? It has the same basic kind of setup in the sense that you have different factions, and you are um, it's a four X game, so you have the same basic rules of any four X game. Like can you tell us what the four X's are? Um, explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. <laughs> Explore, explore the land, uh, 
basically your entire uh, area. And in this game, it's the planet that you will explore. Um, and you have to expand, you have to keep building uh, bases uh, constantly. You have to exploit, as in you have to exploit natural resources in order to build your base, in order to build your populations, in order to build your military tech and so on. And finally, of course, exterminate, which is kind of, uh, you know, it's it sounds Dalek-like, but it's, uh, it's, if you want, you can engage in combat with other factions, but irrespective of whether or not you want it, you will have to engage in some form of combat with planets' life forms. So this is this is one of those things in which you have to you have to fight. So it's turn based. So you you play a turn, every other faction plays a turn, and so on. So it's, that's the that's the very uh, basic. Uh, setup, uh, which is the same like civilization, but I think that the that the differences are are um, are quite remarkably different, which makes this game. I I don't share superficial similarities with civilization. I would say, but beyond that, it's completely a genre of its own. And I mean, if you look at '90s games and compare, there is nothing similar to this. And Civilization, I don't think, has ever reached the heights of this particular game, even in its latest version. And 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 uh, yeah, so um, and I can I can see, I can put that on record. Yeah, a completely I would agree objective with you, take actually. on the game. <laughs> um, and and I'm I never really played Alpha Centauri when I was a kid. I played Civilization though. I was obsessed with the Civilization game that is from the same era as this one, which is Civ Two. Um, I played Civ Two basically all through middle and high school fairly obsessively. Um, and they are very different despite having, as Bloody said, superficial similarities. Um, for me, the, the interface initially seemed similar um, in the sense of, oh, I know how to move things around. There's a tech tree. I'm watching three different resources and have to stack them up to buy things and build things. Um, and you have the same movement mechanics and sort of the same combat mechanics. But the the first big difference for me is actually what Bodhi just mentioned. In civilization, I mean, it's extremely unlikely, but it is technically possible to never engage in combat. Mm. It's technically possible. And that's because there is no hostile landscape in civilization. And that fundamental difference between Alpha Centauri and civilization, I think kind of spins up the rest of the game that you have a fundamentally hostile environment that you're playing within and then further hostility layered on top from the other factions. And you don't really have a choice in not developing capabilities of dealing with hostility. Yeah. That actually gets me into something I wanted to make sure we talked about up front, which is the these ideological factions. And, and as, as we watch this gameplay video, I'm gonna bump up against an, a, a, another faction. I think I already have the Lord's Believers who, who are hostile to my way of doing things and immediately start uh, pressuring me. But um, could, could, you, uh, could you all talk a little bit about, just give some examples of some of the factions and talk a bit about um, how that structures gameplay. I know that's also a little bit different than civilization where there are national factions, but they're not quite as distinctive in play style and in characterization as the faction leaders are in this game. Katie, which one was your favorite faction? <laughs> this feels like a, a very psychologically relevant, relevatory question. Um, so with full consciousness of that, I will admit that I really like the hive. And- um, Tell us what, what's up with the hive. So the Hive are collectivist, technology-focused, somewhat anti-individuality. They tend towards the submersion of the individual into a human and machine collective um, over the course of the game. Um, they have some links to Chinese legalism uh, in terms of their like source texts that they use, but I found very quickly that they moved away from that 
conception. Um, yeah. But I like the high for the same reason I like the Borg. <laughs> I find it interesting. Like, wh where's the compulsion? Like, yeah. why? Do, what's? What can you convince people to do this very inhuman thing? Why? Why is that there? So and the, yeah. the game has a social engineering system specifically. Uh, it allows you to pick different forms of governance at different scales and levels. Uh, for example, cybernetics or planned economies, and you could stack those governance levels. And you know, the hive, it seems to me, leans into the concept of social engineering and the mechanics of social engineering much more uh, uh, aggressively than the other factions. But they will be hostile to you if you are if you are democratic. Sometimes, if they're yes. adjacent to a democratic, uh, for example, like a green sort of green eco democratic society, they 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 will they will sort of um, begin hostilities and lash out and begin applying pressure um so it's a yeah. very aggressive faction <laughs> i like um, i love that you picked the hive well i mean yeah uh so now i have to ask the same question buddy which mm -hmm. which faction is yours uh it's the university for um for obvious reasons i guess i am, and here i am still at the university um I mean, this has uh, the reason I like the university is because they are basically like a knowledge society. Uh, they are primed for research and they don't really care about much else than pure knowledge. So that's that's their entire kind of agenda. And they can be pretty hostile to anything that stands in the way. So they can be pretty hostile to the uh, to the Gaians, for instance. So there are seven factions, right? So there's there's the 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 Gaians, the Gaia Step Daughters, who's um, Lady Deirdre Sky, and she's the environmentalist. That's kind uh, of my chosen uh, group, the sort of eco feminists, as I call them. There's the there's the um, uh, the Spartan Federation, who are very militaristic. So they are even more aggressive than the Hive in some ways. Uh, and then the Lord's Believers, a faction that I never played as uh, <laughs> all these years. I recently mm -hmm. actually played this game as Lord's Believers and didn't like the experience, but uh, that's uh, that's another faction. And then you have the UN, which is the peacekeeping forces. Oh, you also have the, the, the uh, Morgan, which is the Morgan Industries, and they're the economic block. Hypercapitalists. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> So you have all these all these different factions, and um, I mean, I I always found uh, Gaians and University as the two factions that I would play as, and I guess that's partly because on the one hand it's like pursuit of pure knowledge, and on the other it's the ecological and the environmental concerns um, that you find. And the other thing about Gaians is that the game really supports you if you are playing as Gaians. So the game is made to be played as Gaians. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the whole logic of the game because that's how you can get to control uh, and also uh, get bonuses uh, for dealing with planetary creatures. And you get, um, for instance, uh, normal factions have problems traveling through fungus and so on and so forth, but the Gaians don't. So Gaians get to that stage early on where they can do things in the game. So why do you like the Gaians, Joey? <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I just, uh, given that we're living in a climate ravaged world and because I feel like in, in video games and role playing, I always end up with the sort of like uh, lawful good faction. That's what it feels like to me. I'm just like a goody two shoes and I want to plant forests and, you know, not fight and uh, ally with the mind worms. And, um, yeah, I will say it's 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 just worth adding uh, to your point, Bodhi, that the the factions that you choose in this game, the faction you choose to play, uh, you know, they come with all kinds of statistical bonuses and sort of like they they nudge you. And we're going to talk more a little bit later about this, but they nudge you toward different play styles that you can choose to adopt or not adopt. But they'll reward you for playing kind of um, in in homology with with your with your faction's ideology, but. The factions also, and the, the ideologies that they espouse kind of um, imply certain stances to the other factions to, um, uh, and to, to one's own citizens. For example, the hive like is, is, is much more likely to put down revolts by doing something called nerve stapling. Um, whereas it's not in, pleasant. It's not terribly pleasant, but it is very efficient. Um, and on the other hand, um, 
the factions also imply different relationships to the planetary system. So they either really, really lean into exploitation or as Bodhi said with the, the Gaians, you end up kind of being able to control and harness the energy of the planet. Um, and so again, something we'll talk about later, there's, there's all of these different environmental worldviews kind of bound up in, in, these, uh, in these different factions. And you know, almost inevitably, I think, you know, as far as I can tell from the, the limited amount I've played, like almost inevitably lead to conflict. The game really operates on the basic assumption that if you are in an ideological boondoggle with one of your neighbors, like it's eventually going to erupt into some kind of um, unpleasantness, whether that's, you know, diplomatic, feather ruffling or actual combat. Uh, and sometimes you're also induced to trade research, which happens to me a few times in this playthrough where uh, you kind of get squeezed by other factions at, you know, at a kind of at the edge of a sword to, to give up some technology that you've discovered. Um, so there's a bit of like kind of swapping of technology and energy credits, which are the game's currency um, that goes on, but it's often ideologically motivated. And that's the way that the leaders frame it when they when they come to shake you down as they, you know, they talk about your ideological differences and either play up their um, similarities with you or their, their stark differences. Um, That's one of the so big contrasts with, with civilization. Um, I mean, which does have play styles that are dependent on, especially in the later versions of the game, on what nation you're playing as, but it's a very surfacey kind of difference mm -hmm. um, and much more removed from a storyline. It's more like, what do you like doing as a player? Yeah. Which, which civilization are you could play as? Um, because the game can function basically the same. Um, and this is shaded so much more toward storytelling in just these little interactions where you have you're being squeezed for technology, but in it's less of a give me thing, which is kind of the translation of the civilization request and more give me thing because, and the because is really variable and very dependent on both your position, their position and your relative power levels. Bodhi, I think you were gonna chime in. Oh, sorry. No, you're good. No, it's the same thing. You can tech uh, because you can construct these probe teams and you can steal tech. So that's uh, that's also um, another uh, very fun game mechanic that I really like. So, yeah. So I guess since we're talking about factions and ideology, I wanted to ask about the, you know, what we've already been talking about a bit, which is role playing your faction. That I think that one thing that makes this game distinctive as compared to other not just Civ, but other real-time strategy games, is it really does encourage you down certain pathways to, um, you know, kind of maximize your faction's ideological adherence, whether that's like just making decisions to, for example, plant forests or go to war um, or, or, or put most of your energy into research versus economic development. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I would wonder like how that's affected your styles of play. And if you, if, if either of you have tried to play or sort of thought about the idea of like the, the role playing aspect in this game and maybe some of the frisson that happens if you don't role play appropriately. Um, like how does the game kind of deal with that? And then also like, how does just opening up this ideological component to the way that you relate to the game um, kind of advance the storytelling and experience? I mean, for me, for me, that is kind of one of the beautiful things about this game uh, is that you're not really thinking in terms of nationality. You're thinking in terms of something else. What values are important to you? And that's kind of uh, going to color everything in the game. So even though the game does not really, it doesn't really punish you for, for doing things that you're action doesn't really naturally allow, but it does support you a lot if you do those things. So for instance, if you have a green economy, right? Or if you have a police state as the hive. So there are things that are built into the game mechanic that really help you. So, um, so you want to contribute, for instance, more to research, then you can do that as Zakharov, the, you know, the university faction, right? And there is, um, no penalty for that or little penalty for that uh, compared to the others. Uh, if you want to research more destructive technologies, right? That's also, uh, so if you are Gaians, 
well, that's not quite what you want to do. And you will probably end up with more drone riots uh, than otherwise, because- What is a drone you... riot? <laughs> so <laughs> so each, each base has uh, populations and you have workers, you have different categories of workers, specialists, citizens, and so on, uh, who contribute to the research and the constructions and developments within that base. And the drones are basically the workers and they are unhappy. They can be unhappy with you. And then you, and, and the nerve stapling that we were talking about earlier. So then you nerve staple them because they start rioting. And when they start rioting, you can't construct things and so on. So there are- well, You don't yeah. have to nerve staple them. You can also just build them a nice uh, recreation facility and a children's creche and uh, a garden, I think maybe. Um, and those things help. A holographic yeah, I, movie theater, I think at one point. <laughs> I, think, I think for me, for me, the, the fact that it is ideology driven was extremely important. Uh, also as a player, but um, I don't know, what do you, what do you, what do you do think? It's what fascinate. It's actually why I decided to uh, come do this talk with you two, despite not really having played Alpha Centauri, was, oh, wait, it's civilization with a storyline? Holy shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and had this moment of thinking about the interaction between gameplay, which is supported by the mechanic, like, the choice of faction could be pretty random at the beginning. I've watched some Let's Plays where people literally roll dice to decide what faction they're gonna play, um, which I think is very common in Let's Plays, like that just happens. But so you can make that choice in, out of naivete and then have an experience where you, while trying to play the game well, as best you can, discover that you are doing things that you yourself as a human being outside of the game find ideologically distasteful. And I am deeply fascinated by games that allow for that kind of self-reflection, do not require it, but have the capacity to induce it. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, I mean, I kind of like pushing my own buttons with this. That's one of the reasons I, when I downloaded this and was playing it, why I was playing The Hive is that I know that I like this stuff to a point and how am I gonna feel when I get there? Like, is it, am I gonna be okay with all of the atrocities? Um, or am I going to regret picking this faction? And as a writer, I'm not really a, a game playing person. Like that's not my primary, format of interacting with science fiction. But as a writer, I'm fascinated with narrative interplay and the narrative interplay of the structure of a game or a story of any kind and the experience of the reader, player, observer and how those are not always the same thing and how they can be reinforced or like contrasted. So it's the thing that I think is most interesting about this game is that it has this ideological component that isn't surface level, that is actually not compelled, but supported by mechanics. So to, to get to one of those mechanics, I think in a little more depth, if I can take advantage of that to segue, is um, is the, the game's technology tree. And I should say the game has a, a sort of faction by faction story um, that you'll get in these big text chunks every little while uh, in the gameplay. But I think what's more interesting and what we've been talking about is the stories you construct out of little pieces of data from all of the menus and interactions in your head about what your leader is thinking. And a lot of that story, a lot of the connective to that story are the decisions that you make about research priorities. Um, and so, you know, this game has this research tree that includes scientific and technological research. Of course, you can research weapons technologies and, and, and computational technologies, but also philosophical, social, and cultural technologies like doctrines and uh, ecological consciousnesses that change the way that you relate again to your citizens and to the planet. Um, and that, you know, make your faction more powerful and also um, uh, give you new opportunities for different kinds of moves in the game, basically. Um, so I was wondering if you could each talk a little bit specifically about, about the, the research tree, uh, because I, I, I think what, what's really cool about it is, it, is it, I mean, for me, I'll just set this up by saying, I think it, it really emphasizes the, 
interplay of government and, and social norms and culture with technology. It doesn't treat technology as its own propulsive teleological force. It gives you a huge number of choices about technology paths to go down. So I'd like to hear about how you all make sense of that research tree uh, and what it opens up storytelling wise. <laughs> He's gonna jump in. Yeah. <laughs> You go first, Thody. Okay. You have more experience with this particular tree than I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean the the so th this is this is where the science fiction element comes in really strongly. Uh, the tech tree, uh, even though it's a '90s tech tree, it's um, you know there's a whole um, so civilization. So I think I think Alpha Centauri kind of begins in a way where where civilization ends and then some, right? So it's, uh, you know, you have at the end of this, you have this, um, uh, <clears throat> you launch your rocket, you're off to another planet and so on and so forth. And the tech tree is kind of, tech tree kind of builds on from that. But I think the main difference, and, and this is someone, as somebody who works on, also on the history of technology, uh, I mean, the civilization tech tree model is the linear model, right? Mm -hmm. It's the linear model of progress that you go from one historical stage to another historical stage to another. You don't have that happening in Alpha Centauri, even though you have like, technologies that stack on top of each other, you don't really have that linearity. Um, in fact, you can have very disruptive breaks. So for instance, there are, there are ways in which you can end the game without actually uh, discovering pretty much anything. You know, you, you can hoard your resources throughout the game on a tiny planet, uh, on a tiny island somewhere, no one discovers you, um, but somebody else launches this project called Threshold to Transcendence. Uh, so it has all these victory conditions. Um, so you can actually be victorious in the game without discovering any tech. And this is just weird. <laughs> Right, so it disrupts the linear model um, of of the of the whole civilization kind of yeah. idea. It's uh, so the original game box set came with this huge tech tree chart, mm -hmm. right? Like a poster. It's beautiful. That poster is absolutely beautiful. It's a collector's item now. So it's um, you know, and these are technologies that you really kind of like. In the '90s, you're thinking, oh, this is the far future. You know, like human machine interface. Oh wow! Singularity mechanics. Oh wow! Fusion power. Oh wow! Like, you, you know, like you know, you're a teenager and you're playing this game. Like, yeah. Oh wow! Oh yes, this is what's gonna come next. Yes, I'm so excited about this. Which is kind of the logic of science fiction, right? So that's my experience of the tech tree. It's really beautiful. It's a gorgeous object, just as an object. Um, and I actually went. I did not purchase because for various reasons, but I went and looked at the tech tree posters um, and was completely reminded of a project I'm working on in my day job right now, which uses a tech tree, except it's a policy tech tree that um, Germany has put together for their energy transition that my department asked me to look at to do an equivalency for us. Like, what would we need to do to have this happen? And like, wh where are the equivalents in our law? Um, and that was, and I was just like, oh my God, it's a tech tree. I hadn't thought of it that way, but it's a tech tree. Uh, and that kind of really brought home the fact that the Alpha Centauri tech tree is deeply embedded in the idea of technology as a social and ethical practice, as well as a mechanical and physical one. Um, so, and I mean, this is techne, like the, the proper Greek idea of like an art um, and government is an art and e economics and understanding the human brain and all of these things. So it flows into and out of policy and ideology as technology, which is something that you see more in later civilization games than in the earlier ones. But I think this might be the first place it shows up in a tech tree. I'm not entirely sure, but I think it is. And it's so striking that you have 
the discovery of methods of control or enlightenment or both as technologies that you achieve in the same way as you achieve fusion power. I, I mean, I, I quickly want to kind of like, uh, you know, um, because this really, the, the thing that you mentioned about the policy paper resembling a tech tree, because this is kind of what futurists do, right? This yeah. is This is the whole idea that you can kind of like predict or create pathways, right? Mm -hmm. Future to possible futures. And, and, I, and I, I'm kind of curious about now about your, um, uh, about the whole work that you do and how, how that kind of work, that kind of policy work uh, would intersect with a game like this. It's just, if I may just- Oh yeah, no, I'll, it's, <laughs> it's fascinating to me because I hadn't really thought of the work I'm doing as game-like though in my last conversation with uh, my boss, I had actually used the word playbook for how do we put this together? We want to put together a playbook and it's like, wait, no, I am describing a, a kind of game um, because, and, and it's a very wide definition of game in the sense that it's not for fun, it's for real, but in the sense that it's a way of structuring sequence um, that the effects of doing task A or passing law B have a radiating pathway effect it opens particular pathways and closes others. Um, and the way you perform a step also opens pathways and closes others. And those pathways are not just technological, but political, ideological, even ethical. Um, and as a historian and as a writer, these are the things that I bring to my work as a policy analyst, is how, how can we look long range at a particular action? Um, what are the, the futures this action implies? Um, and I think Alpha Centauri and other like 90s era 4X games in a way have made me a better historian, I think, just because you think about the, the ripple effects more. It's less events happen. It's more like I did this eight turns ago and now I'm here. <laughs> I think the, the the thing that I like about the way you two are talking about this and how it's structured in the game, which are tied in with each other, is that like I've, I've looked at some other um, real-time strategy games from this period and turn-based ones, right? Um, but I'm thinking more of like Age of Empires and Rise of Nations, which are two historical series that are quite popular, one of whom, which Rise of Nations was created by this one of the co-creators of this game. But they're masterfully done, but they have these very teleological technology trees um, they take you through historical epics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you go through the Stone Age or Bronze Age, or you go through like the Renaissance or something, right? And and really, it's just all about um, saving up enough resources to get the next thing. And every society is actually going to run in lockstep. Like there was a, I was I'm watching a lot of Let's Plays. Like it sounds like we all have recently. And um, there was a, a person in one of these games, and they were playing as a, a Western European nation, and they were uh, at war with a South Asian nation and they were proceeding along the exact same technological pathways and the game would have little um, uh, uh, notifications like, oh, you know, the, uh, you know, the South Asian, like, you know, whatever the Indian uh, empire has like discovered this. And it was like some Renaissance term. It was like, you know, it's like the same um, sort of w Western model of, of, of like a teleological, really deterministic vision of, of technological and social uh, advancement. Uh, and then it's mapped onto all of the societies, no matter where they come from or, or what their presumed priorities are. And I mean, it, it's really like, it, it's fine to get through the game, but it, it doesn't allow you much space to tell stories. And then of course it flattens out history and cultural difference quite a bit. And what I like here is like, there's even these small things of like, when I was recording my very bad playthrough, uh, I offered the Hive a technology and they didn't want it. Uh, it was some sort of uh, philosophical thing. And, and yeah, Chairman Young, who's, who's the Hive's leader, he was like, oh, I don't want that. That's garbage. Like, I don't want that garbage in my, uh, in my, in my data links or whatever, right? So it was like he, you know, there wasn't this idea of like, okay, yeah, we all need to achieve the same 20 steps so we can get the best cannons or whatever to fight each other. It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm pruning and crafting a society that's, that's uh, you know, technocultural and that um, uh, the, the knowledge that we, uh, develop and the technologies that we adopt actually will will change 
the complexion of our society and allowed me to kind of start thinking about that in a way. Uh, and it made it feel like we were really in more of a contest of ideas and not just a, not just a, a kind of a, a fight, you know, a fight to the death. Um, so if we're, since we're talking a lot about 4X games right now, well, actually, Bodhi, should we show some uh, secret project videos? Because I feel like we're, we're holding out on people if we don't. Yes, that would be great. Think? Okay, so well, before we get off tech, because I have another thing I really want to make sure we have time to talk about, but, um, uh, and, that, and that both of these folks will have really smart things to say about. But first, um, when you get uh, to certain points in, in various uh, arms of this, of this technology tree, you can uh, discover or, or, or put a huge amount of resources into researching these secret projects, which are huge technological advances that give you permanent bonuses. Um, and I think only one faction can have each secret project. So it gives you a huge leg up. Um, so whoever gets to it first um, ends up having it. And uh, on top of that, the videos represent uh, a, vid a little video plays when you discover the secret project. It's about 30 seconds. And they really, uh, I think, cement this game as like a classic piece of science fiction because they're really stylistically diverse, as you'll see. Um, and they partake in all kinds of science fictional and sort of filmic genres. Uh, some of them are funny, some of them are incredibly sad and moving. Um, and uh, what we did uh, is take the liberty to pull together six of the like, I don't know, 30 or 40 of them. And so we have about three minutes of um, very bombastic science fiction video uh, to show you. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about some of these secret projects and the game's aesthetic, I think. As the writhing, teeming mass of mind worms swarmed over the outer perimeter, we saw the defenders recoil in horror. Stay calm, use your flame guns, shouted the commander, but to no avail. It is well known that the mind worm boil uses psychic terror to paralyze its prey, and then carefully implants ravenous larvae in the brains of its still conscious victims. Even with the best weapons, only the most disciplined troops can resist this horrific attack. Lady Deidre Sky, our secret war. Of course we'll bundle our Morganet software with the new network nodes. Our customers expect no less of us. We have never sought to become a monopoly. Our products are simply so good that no one feels the need to compete with us. The earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot stay in the cradle forever. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the father of rocketry. Data links. If I determine the enemy's disposition of forces while I have no perceptible form, I can concentrate my forces while the enemy is fragmented. The pinnacle of military deployment approaches the formless, if it is formless, then even the deepest spy cannot discern it, nor the wise make plans against it. Sun Tzu, The Art of War, Data Links I shall not confront planet as an enemy, but shall accept its mysteries as gifts to be cherished. Nor shall I crudely seek to peel the layers away like the skin from an onion. Instead, I shall gather them together as the tree gathers the breeze. The wind shall blow and I shall bend. The sky shall open and I shall drink my fill. Guyan Acolyte's Prayer I believe Planet will talk to us if we're willing to listen. These fungal stalks behave as multi-state relays. Taken together, the neural net connectivity must be staggering. Can a planet be said to have achieved sentience? Lady Deidre Sky, Arguments in Council. 
so for that, you know, for the for these secret projects, I don't know if there's a ton more to say than we've already said about the research tree, but I we couldn't help wanting to to show you those to give you a sense of some of the game's world building and the different directions in which it goes. Uh, Bodhi, Arkady, anything to add about secret projects? Or um, I, I always is like a you know a, an ex film major. I'm just like really taken by all of the different styles that they adopt, and we're only showing you a tiny slice here. They're some of the most inventive short cutscenes in 90s gaming, I think. Um, they remind me of nothing so much as actually missed cutscenes, like that same kind of, especially coming into them having, because I watched a whole bunch of them before I had actually played any of the game. So it was this deep immersion in the world itself and the tiny snippets of information about it. And there's a kind of, deep disturbance and horror, which is underneath a lot of it. And it's very beautiful, despite the graphics, um, or maybe because of them in a weird way, like you get this kind of fuzzed, broken up record of a time that maybe happened a thousand years in the past and you're looking back at it. Like that's what it felt like to me. Um, so I love them. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about, but I mean, the, the videos, the few videos that we, that we kind of saw um, um, just now, uh, and we have the, the Citizens Defense Force, and then we have the Xeno Empathy Dome and so on. And it's kind of like, so <clears throat> these different projects also stack on top of each other in a way. So, uh, so when we have, you know, we have this terrifying image of the mind worms taking over control of, of these citizens and the forces and so on, right? And it's about battling planetary uh, creatures. And then you have something like the, the, the later uh, project, the Xeno Empathy Dome, where you realize, oh my God, the planet is alive, right? That's, that's what that video is about, that the planet will talk to us if you listen, right? So so the the all the fungi all the creatures that you are that you have been fighting so far and it's this uh, sudden realization that oh this is there's a different condition here and this kind of like leads to the the, the victory conditions that you have in the game and and this is this is also very much the influence of 80s and 90s science fiction in a way and all the ecological themes that are kind of coming in uh, because that that particular model is very much the Asim late Asimovian foundation planet being alive Gaia theory model, right? That's that's fed right into this. So I, I mean, they are they are beautiful, and all the different styles are are and and the the quirky nature of them. They're really, um, uh, I think they're a bit bizarre, <laughs> frankly yeah. speaking. Um, like why is, why does this why are there so many styles? I mean, what's the point? But it's just there and somehow it works. <laughs> that's that's how it one is. Of the, the real merits actually is the stylistic difference. To me, it takes away from the, the sense that the, this game was made in a particular time period and hampered by particular levels of visual technology and allows for it to feel more like a palimpsest, like how the people living on planet would record and symbolize their own events. Like what would they do? Would it be from a drone camera? Would it be a kind of um, cartoon pamphlet like that first one with the mind worms? Um, to me, it's a really generative internal storytelling tool. One one quick thing that I kind of want to add about the about the videos and also about the game as a whole is the kind of references that it feeds into all these uh, project videos. The text, uh, this game is very text heavy. Uh, I mean, we can we can go into the whole transmedial world building because there's like uh, three different novels. There's a graphic novel. There's a lot of texts which went around the game, right? So it's it's a proper science fiction world outside the game too. Uh, 
but the but the kind of quotations that we find so some of those are from real historical figures right so we had we had that uh, video with um, Siolkovsky uh, talking about um, you know human uh, future in space we have Sun Tzu we have we have so many others we have Plato we have Machiavelli it's it's a fascinating range of texts that feed into this um, this and the projects are kind of like the, the the apex of some of these ideas I think yeah giving the sense that like there is a deep cultural memory behind this which I think in some you know in some science fiction texts and like some science fiction video games I've played certainly you're in a future and like you know that everybody originally came from earth and here we are fighting you know being space marines or whatever but there's a lot of connections to uh like earth culture or cultural heritage um, a lot of times that stuff gets erased or it gets replaced with a totally new set of signifiers but this uh the, the people creating this game i think want to create the sense that these people on planet are stuck with earth's history and have to try to strategically marshal it in a variety of ways um, and even though they're trying to create a new society on um you know previously uninhabited at least by humans uh, soil that they still have all of this cultural memory and all of these biases and inequities and ideals that they have to grapple with even if they're going to reject them they have to kind of make use of them um, and that's pretty poignant I think. There's real deep continuity between earth culture and centauri culture and one of the just to tie back to something we were talking about earlier about the merits and flaws of role-playing as the faction you've chosen. There's a sense that you can reject some of the world before, but also sometimes you get stuck in an ideological construct of the world before and can't give it up. And that leads to particular outcomes in the game. And I really enjoy that kind of deep world building. It's something I try to do in my own work. So, I want to, but we're actually very rapidly running out of time, but I, but I want to ask you all about something that I think is absolutely essential and that I wanted to save until we had put enough, enough of the pieces on the board about, about what the game's about and what it's aspiring to do, which is, uh, I think, uh, at the heart of all 4X games, which is uh, colonialism. Um, many of these games um, imagine colonial encounters, whether they're in the future or the restaging colonial encounters from the past. Uh, and, you know, uh, making colonial brutality interactive in various ways. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering how you think Alpha Centauri stages colonial encounters uh, on this other planet uh, and how it maybe falls into patterns or questions and subverts them from, from other science fiction texts, from other games, from other historical understandings. Um, how does it play in that, in that complicated geography? I actually want to leap off of something that Bodhi said a couple minutes ago about the moment where you realize the planet is alive. Um, because that is, it's, it's one of those gorgeous gestalt moments that the internal narrative that you're constructing um, for your faction leader, no matter which faction it is, is very sharply changed at that moment because you have to grapple with this either very surprising um, or something that is deeply confirming of a worldview if you're playing the Gaians, like, hey, it's real, it, it actually worked. Um, but that moment of realization for many of the factions in, in, and in some ways, including the Gaians, is one which makes explicit the implicit colonial narrative of Alpha Centauri because it, requires you to deal with the fact that you've spent the entire game up to this point taking apart, destroying, exterminating, and otherwise making use of a live being. And what you do next is very shaped and framed by that realization or could be. And I mean, I want to say that like the game does not require you to think about it this way um which I sort of wish it did but it wouldn't have done as well if it had <laughs> um but if you're doing that internal ludonarrative work of building a story around the actions you're taking 
that moment of realization is one that should have an effect in some way. Yeah. Uh, all these games are in some ways or the other about colonialism. And they are also in a way, and this is kind of the challenge of science fiction in a way, how do you, how do you escape the colonial narrative of first contact? Right. That's that Star Trek. That's all these uh, narratives, right? And and uh, which takes one to kind of one of the things that this game has, which are all the different science fiction elements that it builds on, which is Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy, right? And one of the things that Mars trilogy does is that it very clearly puts this in front of the reader, calls this the Delta V of history, right? That that how do you escape? the pull of history when you go to Mars? How do you escape human history? Can you actually escape the violence, the darkness and all of that when you go to another planet? Uh, so the I'm game sure kind no. of, <laughs> <laughs> yes. In, 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 uh, in this game, the answer is like, probably not, but it's also, but at the same time, one of the strategies that the game does give you is to ultimately give yourselves to the planet, right? So you give yourself over to the planet and that's what is transcendence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, a, that's also a possible victory condition. And this is what I was talking about earlier in terms of like, like the tech tree and the linearity and how it rejects that linearity. Because here is a technology that is actually anti-technology. It's giving up. Yeah, and it's it's yes. surrender in a in a very spiritual sense. Yes, and I find that absolutely fascinating that it lets you do that. Uh, does it entirely escape colonialism? No, not at all. No, um, these none of these games do. I don't but, think a forex game is really capable of escaping colonialism. Yeah, like by the function of the fact that it's a forex game. Um, but it's. I do think there are ways for even a forex game to engage with colonialism, to like make it a discussion as opposed to a given. And I think Alpha Centauri gets a long way towards that. Yeah. And this is this is where also its difference from civilization games is so clear. Very. Uh, including civilization beyond earth, which is kind of considered to be like the spiritual successor to Alpha Centauri. Um, yeah, I, we don't have time to talk about the, the um, alien crossfire expansion, but uh, another time perhaps, is that does something interesting to this. Yeah, I think just by peopling, as, as you two have talked about the environment, uh, that's a really powerful change. Like all of the ones that I played when I was you know, younger, when these games were coming out, you, you encounter these empty landscapes and they have natural resources on them. They don't even usually have animals. Um, and that, you know, there's a probably technical reasons that they don't have some of that detail, but it's also deeply uh, decision based like you can uh, portray these regions of the earth historically as as people as 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 inhabited or you can choose to make them empty spaces for exploitation and that's what almost all these games do and just the simple move of making the planet home to indigenous beings and then also as Arkady talked about the powerful turn of making the planet itself sentient. Um, th those, I mean, those seem like really significant moves, even if they're not like always present moment to moment or perfect. Like, I think they go a huge way from the kind of like low friction slash no friction version of this that exists in like most other strategy games. Like it doesn't have to be perfect to be interesting. I mean, that's something I really believe about art in general. And I do think that this game is absolutely a gorgeous piece of art. Um, it doesn't have to go all the way towards any particular idealized success. Um, if it engages with ideas and makes them complex, that's more than enough, at least for me. Um, and this one does it. I mean, like I was saying, it's possible to play it without really dealing with it, but it's hard to play it without at least thinking about it a little bit. Uh, and I think that's really good narrative design. 
So um, I had hoped that we could talk about this for a long time, but before we, we, we say farewell, which we'll do shortly, I, I wanted to ask each of you, are there one or two science fictional texts that you feel like this game alludes to and builds on or that have, you know, that are just similar in some really meaningful way to you? Um, Bodhi mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy. Um, and I think that's a really important one, but, but are there one or two other things that you can point people towards that, that you either think feed into this or that just feel like if you like this game and what it's doing that uh, there's more of that out there? I'm trying to think of living planet things that, I, that are recent that <laughs> I like. There's a, this is a weird one. I'm gonna have to look it up while we're talking because I've forgotten the title at this point. There's a Theodore Sturgeon short story um, which is kind of a living planet story um, which, in which the characters are colonists and they actually experience de-evolution over the course of the story. Um, mm -hmm. And they're grappling with like the moral or ethical rightness or wrongness of that is what drives the plot. Um, I will look it up uh, while perhaps Bodhi tells us something that is less obscure. <laughs> I like that. Maximally obscure. That's very good. Not that obscure. I could have picked a really obscure one. That's true. Yeah. It is true, Jim. <laughs> uh, Bodhi, one or, one or two things uh, that Ooh, people can look um, to. Yeah, other than, other, than, other than Mars trilogy, I mean, one of the things that is really influenced by is, of course, uh, Dune, Frank Herbert's Dune. Um, Dune novels, I would say at least the first three, and also very clearly, um, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey. Mm -hmm. It's very clearly influenced by that. There's influence of Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. Oh, yes, and, for sure. Um, but I think the most interesting one uh, is not often mentioned in connection to this game, which is Solaris, Tennis Law Lem. Um, mm. So I think, I think if people want to like, look at like a living planet yeah. that's the book to go to uh it's and a planet that reflects back human desires and fears back on yes. the humans right like very much like happens in this game um yeah, yeah. that's a great one you know to, to to stay in in eastern europe um uh or that that part of the world i i was thinking of the strigatskis and the roadside picnic and like the film stalker um, these like strange terrains, um, because the idea that you land on this planet, you're starting your first city or two, and then suddenly there's like mind burrowing worms that pop up and start attacking you. I don't know, it felt very much like that to me. And then to know that the ground you're walking on is alive at a certain point, and if you're immersed in the game, that's a really, really, it's, it's quite a gut punch of a moment um, when, it, when it first happens. Um, so yeah, I, I think um, the Strugatskis uh, are, an, are an interesting one that maybe isn't like, as central to the way the game setting up its world building, but it evoked the same feeling in me. Arky, did you figure out the story? Yes, story? it's called the Golden Helix. The Golden Helix. Okay. It is right. in a short story collection, which is Selected Stories of Theodore Sturgeon, which you can get on Amazon, which is actually, I think, where I first ran into it. Um, it's got some other really good ones that are unrelated to our current discussion. It's got Thunder and Roses in it and Killdozer and Slow Sculpture. <laughs> Bodhi has so. it on his screen. Yep. There you go. Right. Just, right. <laughs> I like how it that was one. in, it, it was also in reach. He didn't even have to do much. Oh yeah, to to I, I was thinking if I couldn't quickly like come up with it via Google, I would get up and go to the bookshelf because I have it over there. <laughs> oh goodness. I love that. Um, we're do, we'll do book show and tell maybe. That should be an, a segment we add to this. Um, so so I'm gonna put in chat just a place where you can learn more about Arcady and Bodhi. And I, and I apologize everyone, we didn't do questions because we had so much to talk about and I wanted to make sure we at least covered like the rudiments of, of, of the, the um, all of the stuff that Bodhi and, and Arcady and I uh, talked about and decided were essential. And then we had to throw away like half of them because we, we, we got so chatty as I always do. It's my influence, I think. Um, but thank you both so much for, for joining me today and being so uh, generous with your time and your intellect. Um, thank you for inviting us. This is this really is great. So Thanks fun. So and like Arcady, I was glad, Bodhi, for the chance to learn about this game and play it. And now I'm like neck deep in this like very poorly managed university playthrough that I need to see through. <laughs> um, so so uh, I just put this in chat, but you, you can find more about Bodhi and his work at cofutures.org. And you can find out more about uh, Arkady and her work at arkadymartin.net. 
uh, and on Twitter at uh, Arkady Martin. And you should also um, buy A Desolation Called Peace, which comes out. In yes, March. especially if you like things about. No, that's a spoiler. Anyway, many of the things we've talked about are important. In Let's just say that book. Yeah, it's <laughs> about it's it's a it's a space. There there are spacefaring books about diplomacy. If you enjoyed this conversation, you will love uh, a memory called Empire. Uh, it engages I many of the so. same. It was why, like when Bodhi and I were talking about this game, I was like, I have just the perfect science fiction writer for this. Well, um, uh, and so, thank you so much for for being available to do that for us. So, um, I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the Center for Science and the Imagination for making this event possible, and especially to Tyler Eglin, who has been running the tech and editing uh, together all of these videos and sitting through all my gameplay uh, to get something coherent together. Um, so we'll be hosting more of these events in 2021. Uh, to get notified about episodes, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter at Imagination ASU, and visit us at csi.asu.edu, where you can also subscribe to our email list and get announcements about this uh, series and other events. So uh, thank you for the last time, Bodhi and Arkady, and, and thank you all so much for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.